Welcome to the next episode of General Relativity. I'm your host, Rifat Bari, graduate student in physics at Brown University. So today we're going to be talking more about something called covector fields. But first, let me recap what we did previously. Previously, we talked about covariant vectors. Covariant vectors. So what are covariant vectors and contravariant vectors? So contravariant vectors change opposite whether you're dealing with the basis vectors or the components of a vector. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you have two basis vectors, e1 and e2, and a vector v, which has components of 2 of e1 and 2 of e2. Now, if I double the size of my basis vectors and call this e1 prime, which is equal to 2 of e1, and e2 prime, which is equal to 2 of e2, then the components for my vector, even though my vector is the exact same, its components will have halved, right? So if I double the size of my basis vectors, I have to have the components of my vector. So what just happened is that the size of the components shrink while the size of the basis vectors expand. So that's why these are called contravariant vectors, because the components change contrary to what the basis changes. So let's mathematically codify that. So if I want to express a tangent vector field, for example, if I have some kind of an object, like a circle, then the tangent vector fields for the circle are all the vectors which are tangent at each point around the circle. We talked about this previously. And let's say I want to codify how these tangent vectors change in both Cartesian coordinates, x and y, and polar coordinates. So this is x and y, and polar coordinates r hat and theta hat. So how do I do that? How do I express how these tangent vectors change in these two different coordinate systems? Well, there's two different things that matter. The components, how the components transform, and how the basis vectors transform. And once again, we'll see that they transform contrary to each other. So how do the components transform? Let's say we want to figure out what the polar coordinates, what the polar coordinates of the tangent vector fields are. Well, we're going to start with the Cartesian coordinates. Let me use a different dummy variable for the Cartesian coordinates. And if I want to get from here to here, what kind of a transformation do I have to use? Well, this Cartesian coordinate has to cancel out. So I have to reproduce this on the bottom. And this polar coordinate has to go on the top. Now, what is this? This fraction right here is the backward transformation matrix, B i sub j. Likewise, if I'm starting from Cartesian coordinates, d c sub i, d lambda, and I want to arrive at this from polar coordinates, how can I do so? Well, I have to multiply not by the backwards transformation matrix, but by the forward transformation matrix. So dc, dp. This dummy variable has to be summed over, and I have to be left with i. So this right here is my forward transformation matrix, f, i, sub j. So this is how the components transform. What about the basis vectors themselves? Well, remember that in tensor calculus, the basis vector e sub x can be written as the derivative of the position vector with respect to that coordinate. And in general, the basis vector in the i hat direction is the derivative of the position vector with respect to that direction. So now, if I start with the basis vectors in polar coordinates, how can I get that from the basis vectors in Cartesian coordinates? Partial r, partial c sub j. Well, somehow, these Cartesian components have to cancel out. So I have to multiply this by partial c sub i, partial p sub j. Right? So the Cartesian components get summed over. The i dummy variable gets summed over. We're left with just a j variable, as we should. Now, take a look at what's happening here. Here, this partial c sub i time over partial p sub j, this is the forward transformation matrix, f i j. So although we use the backward transformation matrix to convert between Cartesian and polar components, we use the forward transformation matrix 
to convert between Cartesian and polar bases. So there's the contrary uh, behavior we were talking about. And if we want to arrive in the opposite direction, if we want to arrive at Cartesian coordinates, starting Cartesian basis vectors, starting from polar basis vectors, well, now we have to multiply by the backwards basis, the backwards transformation matrix, B, I, sub J. So this right here captures the nature of contravariant vectors. Even though we use the backwards transformation matrix to convert between Cartesian and polar components, we use the forward transformation matrix to convert between Cartesian and polar bases. That's the contrary behavior. Forward matrix, backwards matrix. Backwards matrix, forward matrix. That's the contrary nature of uh, contravariant vector fields. But we can apply the same notion to just vectors themselves. So let's do that over here. So we can apply the same idea to just vectors instead of vector fields. Once again, we're going to compare how components transform versus how basis vectors transform. So let's look at a basis vector EI and EJ. Let's say EI represents the Cartesian coordinate vectors x and y, and EI tilde represents the polar coordinate vectors p1 and p2, which stand for r and theta. So if I want to get if I want to get to polar coordinates from Cartesian coordinate bases, how do I do that? Well, I have to apply I have to apply the forward transformation matrix. The dummy variable i is summed over and I'm left with just the j variable as, as intended. Likewise, if I want to end up with Cartesian basis vectors, starting from polar basis vectors, what do I have to do? I have to use the backwards transformation matrix, B i sub j. Once again, the i dummy variable is summed over. I'm left over with only j. Now let's come over here to components. How do the components transform? The components will transform in the opposite way. So V i tilde, the components of the polar coordinates, can be obtained from V j, the components of the Cartesian uh, object, by using the backward transformation matrix, B i j. So the dummy variable j gets summed over, and just i is left over. So this is how we get from Cartesian to polar coordinates, by using the backward transformation matrix, which notice is the opposite of the forward transformation matrix. Likewise, to obtain polar, to obtain Cartesian coordinate components from polar Cartesian, com uh, from polar components, we have to use the forward transformation matrix. And so now you can see once again the contrasting behavior. To get the components, I have to use the backward transformation matrix, but to convert the bases, I use the forward transformation matrix. Backward, and forward. So you can see the contrary nature of contravariant vectors right in full display here. To convert between Cartesian and polar basis vectors, I use the forward transformation matrix. To convert between Cartesian and polar components, I have to use the backward transformation matrix. And likewise for the reverse case. Whereas I have to use the backward transformation matrix for this one, I have to use the forward transform for this one. So that's a recap of what we did in the. Okay, so now let's talk about covectors. What are covectors? So covectors are much like row vectors in a sense. Row vectors, for example, this vector, are just a column vector that has been transposed, right? So if I take a column vector like 2, 1, and I apply the transpose operator, I get a row vector. But it turns out this only holds true if you have orthogonal bases, like Cartesian coordinates. But if you don't have orthogonal bases, in general, if you have, for example, some different bases vectors, E1 tilde and E2 tilde, then you can no longer say that the transpose of a column vector is a row vector. So somehow we need to generalize the idea of row vectors to tensor calculus. And how do we do that? Well, covectors have three main properties. Their first property is that they're a function, alpha, which takes vectors v to real numbers. Okay, we'll explore that shortly. The second property that they satisfy is the linearity property, in that if I apply a covector function to two vectors, then it's the same as applying the distributive property. I can apply that covector to each vector individually. 
And finally, the last property of covectors is the property of scalar multiplication. If I apply a covector function to a scalar times a vector, that's the same thing as taking that scalar outside and just applying the covector function to the vector. Now let me explain what I mean by this first property. A covector takes a vector to a real number. Let's say I have a simple function, a simple vector function, which is 2x plus 3y. Now this function is a function of both x and y, so I should put x comma y here. And let's try to analyze this function for different values of the output. Let's say we analyze it for minus 2, minus 1, 0, and 2. What does this function's contours look like? Well, the contours of this function are just going to be straight lines, straight lines with the slope given by this function. And let's say that this is a contour where the function is equal to 0. This is a contour where the function is 1, where the function is 2, where the function is minus 1, and where the function is minus 2. And here is the origin of this covector field. I'll call it alpha. And this is the direction of increasing function value for my covector field. This is what a covector field looks like. And let's say that I have a vector in this covector field. Let's say I have a vector v. When I apply my covector function alpha to this vector v, what that will give me is just the number of lines, the number of contours that this vector v crosses. So it crosses one two lines. So the covector function applied to the vector v is just 2. Likewise, if I have, let's do another example. Here's another covector field. I'll call it beta. And let's say here's my vector v. Uh, let's do something different. Let's say this is my vector v. If I apply the covector function to vector v, I'll just get 1 because the covector has only one contour that passes through the vector v. Now, how do we add two covector fields? Let's say that I have two covector fields. I'll say that this right here is the covector field alpha with origin here, and this is the direction of increasing function value, and the co-function covector function beta, which has vertical contour lines, and it has an origin here and increasing function value here. How do we add these two covectors? Well, let's say that I have a vector in this covector space. I'll call that vector v. If I apply alpha to v, then I'll just get 1, 2, because the function, the vector, passes through two contours. Likewise, if I take this vector v and I apply the covector v, the covector beta to this function v, I'll get 1, 2, 3. So now if I add these covector fields, I'll get something that's not horizontal or vertical, but a covector field that's 45 degrees. And that has an origin here, and this is the di direction of increasing ascent. And if I draw my function, my vector again here, here's my vector v. Notice that alpha plus beta, this is the covector field of alpha plus beta, applied to my vector v is now 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5. Okay, let's say that this is... This is where it starts. Huh? Yeah. So I didn't draw it from the origin. It's not drawn to scale. But the idea is that covector addition is just like regular addition. Geometrically, it makes sense. The field is just the sum of the two individual fields. In other words, alpha plus beta applied to B is the same thing as alpha applied to V plus beta applied to V. Alpha applied to V is 2, beta applied to V is 3, and that gives you your final co-vector. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.